Hey, we love to answer the questions that you ask. And one of the questions I get asked a lot, especially in my marriage counseling or people that are having a lot of problems, is why doesn't my spouse fulfill me? And so that's a question that we're going to answer today. We'd love to answer your questions. It keeps us in touch. And I know we're hitting the pulse of where you're at if we're answering your questions. So I'm Mitch, and this is Kim, and we're with Keeping the Vows. Where we'd like to help you discover and maintain a Christ-like marriage. Yeah, great. Uh, don't really have a question to read today, but just a lot of people have asked us this over the years. So one of the things that happens uh, for us is that, let me give you an illustration. Kim and I had been married for several years, and we farmed, and they have this irrigation system. It looks like a wagon, but it has a big gun on it, and it goes around and irrigates and sprays your crops. It's called a traveler irrigation. And the ones we had, I just hated working with them, and they were big machines. They were took long fields, and they were hard to roll up, and the soil we had was, it was just, it was just a bad thing. And Kim noticed that I'd been kind of grumpy for a day or so. And <clears throat> at lunch one day, she said, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. She said, I know you've been unhappy the last couple of days. Do you, have, do you think it has anything to do with the fact that you're getting the travelers out and getting them serviced and getting ready for the irrigation system? And wow, a light came on in my head. I was like, oh, yes, that's it. I'm dreading working with these travelers. But see how I could have been upset and thought that Kim wasn't fulfilling me or I could have been upset with Kim or something like that. But it wasn't Kim at all. What was tainting my whole mood was these irrigation systems. And I didn't even realize it. So if things aren't going well in our relationship, the tendency we have is to look to our spouse and figure out what's wrong, right? What if I'd have been looking at Kim trying to figure out what's wrong with her, but I was upset? And maybe the little things that she does that normally never bother me, we all have idiosyncrasies, okay? What, what if... <laughs> hey, just listen. <laughs> just tease it. <laughs> So what if the little things that normally never bother me all of a sudden become big because of this irrigation thing, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I admire most about Kim is, you've heard her say this maybe in some of our videos, is if something's going wrong or it seems like we're headed toward an argument, she or maybe I say something it's kind of cutting or she thinks it hurts her, she steps back and examines herself because maybe she thinks she's in the frame of mind that that thing I said, I didn't really mean it like that at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say something cutting or something to hurt her, really. So... The first thing she does is examine herself to see if she's in the right frame of mind before she comes looking at whether or not I'm in the right frame of mind. Absolutely. Yeah, but as I saw her do that, it really transformed me because I didn't used to do that. And so now it's helped me to become that type of person who, when I get, frust when I get frustrated and upset, I will look and think, okay, is there something else going on in my life right now? So that's something that can head off a lot of things in, in being fulfilled by your spouse. Maybe you're letting outside influences come in and letting things bother you that would normally never bother you. So that's just something to think about. Yeah. For me, that was a big one. That's It's really easy to do. So take a look at yourself first. So the first thing you want to do is go into marriage with the right expectations. You know, a few years back, we went to this church that was looking for a pastor. And so uh, one week they asked the people in the congregation what they wanted in a pastor. And the uh, people turned in what they thought and everything got compiled. The next Sunday they brought it, their request. And uh, when they read all the qualifications in front of the congregation, <laughs> which was a long list. It was longer um, than that, yeah. It made us realize okay, there wasn't any one person that could possibly fulfill all those qualifications. I don't yeah. know. I don't think Jesus would have even qualified probably. No, he couldn't have. You know, some people wanted one thing and other people didn't want the same thing. So you yeah. weren't, there was no way you were going to make everybody happy. I bet it's like 100 and f 150 different things they had that they wanted. They went on and read for a long time. Yeah. It was almost embarrassing, actually. It really was. Thinking. That's true. We're pretty self-centered. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it can be the same with our spouse. You know, maybe we've never actually written out what we expect from our spouse, but if you stop and you're honest with yourself, how long is your list of things that you expect from your spouse? And, and that's just not realistic because uh, God didn't give me Mitch to fulfill my expectations, you know. Uh, he wants our marriage to make us more like him, and when actually when we don't get along, I, I learn to lean on God more. Yeah, and we can actually, I just thought of it now, We can some of our expectations might not even be godly. It's True. something to think about, True. you know. Uh, think about your expectations for marriage, for love, and unity. It might interest you to know that only within about the last 50 to 75 years have people actually been marrying for love. Before that, they, for thousands of years, marriage was about gaining the right in-laws, 
the right prestige, and uh, a helpmate for handling daily tasks. Well, with all the automated things that we have now, a lot of the tasks around the house are easier, but even then, would you sweep the floor for me, even though we have a vacuum, or would you put the, would you load the dishwasher instead of would you do the dishes? We all still have our expectations. I think our expectations today are very, very high and probably not realistic. We expect emotional fulfillment, we expect sexual fulfillment, and we, ha we want shared interest to be right there, as well as someone to help us with the chores. <laughs> not to mention somebody who agrees with me on how to raise kids <laughs> and, you know, on and on. Yeah, massages my feet at night or things like that, okay? <laughs> so our, if, our, if our expectations are more realistic, we should expect to have a spouse that we're interested in and then over time develop an, and nurture an interest into the love that only God can instill. So instead of saying my expectations are all these little frivolous things have to be met, maybe instead say, hey, I need a spouse that I'm interested in, and then I'm going to work at, at grooming all these other things and work at making myself as good as I can be at all of these other things. hope that makes sense. Thank you me. know, uh, the other thing, too, is that God has created us as we are because God is the creator. And one of the things that we tend to do is we tend to get our roles confused, and we tend to try to take God's place <laughs> instead of our place. So... I am the created. I am not the creator. I am not. Um, I used to look at Kim and there was little things about her that were different than me. And those same things that I loved before we got married became obstacles after we got married. And I began early in our marriage to think, well, if Kim was just more like me, this would be better. If she was more like me, this thing would just be better. This marriage would be better. But you know what? I was totally wrong. And what I was really saying was, God, you're the creator. You created Kim the way that you did it. But you know what? You messed up a little bit. Let me come in and try to work this over, and I'll, I'll fix your boo-boo, God. That's what I'll do. <laughs> and that's incredibly arrogant. That's incredibly arrogant. God made Kim the way that he did for a purpose. And he made opposites attract for a purpose. And maybe the things about Kim that used to kind of bother me are the very things that I need to rub up against me in my life to make me different than I am. So the fact that I'm I'm type A and I'm really motivated and I'm, I'm really go-getter, maybe the fact that Kim is calm and takes 15 or 20 seconds to think before she speaks and she's she's quiet and she's shy, maybe those are all attributes that'll make me more of a, a more Christ-like, a more centered person. And that's what I've come to learn over the time is the very things that I used to look at in Kim that used to bug me are the very things now that I appreciate. And she'll do something that used to bug me, and I'll look at her and say, I wouldn't change a thing about you. I love everything about you. And think about how that makes her feel. Early in our relationship, when I was trying to change her, think about how that made her feel. She don't, I don't think she felt loved. I don't think she felt accepted. I don't think she felt cherished. She just felt as though I wasn't going to be happy unless she changed. And maybe I didn't even know what that looked like. Um, there was a guy that uh, I did counseling for him and his wife, and he said this, he said, my wife isn't in love with me. She's in love with the man she wants me to be. And she won't be happy unless I'm that man. Hmm. The man didn't feel loved and accepted. And, you know, I don't think he was loved and accepted. And I counseled with her and she wasn't going to change. And so eventually then they got divorced because she, she wouldn't be happy unless she could change the man. Instead of loving the person that God created. She thought she was the creator and she had a hand up on God. That's just... Like a guy said one time, I need charts and graphs to show you how wrong that is, okay? That we're a better creator than God. So think about that. When Kim accepts me in spite of my imperfections, it makes me want to accept her in spite of her imperfections. Something to think about. Yeah, and I would challenge you to take some time and stop and actually think about that. Because the first time... Um, I heard this concept that when I try to change Mitch, I'm trying to take a place of God. Well, that really hits you, and yeah. I, I don't want to try to take the place of God. Yeah. So, um, I think God's saying, I made you opposite so that you could become more like me, and we're trying to say, no, I don't want to be like you. I want her to be more like me. And when you look at it like that, I, that's an incredibly selfish uh, place to be coming yeah. from. And, hey, I was there. I was the king of it, yeah. We both were. And like he says, it's so much better now when we both accept one another for who we are. It yeah. does make both of us feel loved and cherished and accepted. And yeah. we'd so much rather be where we are now than where we were back then. Yeah. You know, Christ has just taught us so much. And so hopefully uh, you can learn from us sharing what we have learned.
Another point is that none of us have it all together, so lower the bar of your expectations. You know, part of marriage is understanding that um, who you really are. So I come to Mitch, you know, this is who I am. Some of it isn't pretty, but uh, I'm, you know, and I'm trying to change these things, but will you please love me the way yeah. I am? This is what I bring you. Will you accept me? I think all of us are saying that and when we get really vulnerable and really honest in our marriages. Because believe me, we don't have it together. I don't know that anybody has it together. Yeah. But I feel loved and I feel accepted by her. And then that, that creates a strong, passionate bond between us. Yeah. So, um, you know, once you admit to yourself that you don't have it all together, then it's easier to lower your expectations. And, you know, um, yeah, I, I want Mitch to uh, forgive me for the things I do wrong and accept me for who I am. And so that makes it easier for yeah. me to do that for him. Yeah. The next thing is to find joy in your spouse's joy. Uh, you know, it's a big mistake for us to expect for our spouse to fulfill us. Yeah. This is kind of opposite of what the world would teach, but, you know, um, I think we both get joy in seeing the other person be happy. Yeah. And we try to help um, them fulfill what's on their heart. I think a lot of times we're brought up in this entertainment thing where we sit down to watch a movie or something. We sit down and say, okay, I'm relaxing, I'm doing nothing, entertain me. <laughs> and what if we do that to our spouse? I'm not an entertainer. I am a little bit funny sometimes. Kim likes that. But I'm not really an entertainer. And I'm not here. God didn't put me here to entertain Kim. He put me here to, to be her equal, to be her helpmate, just as she's my helpmate. I believe one of the biggest mistakes we can make in a marriage is expecting our spouse to totally fulfill us. Our spouse was never designed to fulfill us. I believe that we have a couple different tanks inside of us. First of all, we have a God tank. And the God tank is only made to be filled by God. And we see people trying to fill it with cars, uh, drugs, uh, possessions, houses, prestige, and everything. But there's nothing that will fill the God spot except God. But we also see people try to fill the God spot with their spouse. And inside of us, there's this vacuum. There's this longing to have this God tank filled. But you know what? Kim is a great person, but Kim will not fill my God tank. And this is why it's so important that we're equally yoked, that we both believe in God. Because if I believe in God and God comes in and fills that, that God tank then all of a sudden I'm a fulfilled person and I'm content and I'm happy. And I had, the, the expectations that I have of what Kim has to do for me come way down. I don't need Kim to create overwhelming joy in my life because Jesus already creates overwhelming joy in my life. And not only that, but it sets me up as a different person. The way that I react to her, the way I respond to her, the way that I initiate things with her is all through this filter of having my God tank full. So I come to her as a totally different person because I have the tank full that only God can fill. And I don't have the anticipation that Kim is going to do that. Very good point. Thank you. And, and God's asking me to fill Kim's love tank. And here's what happens. I find that it's kind of a paradox. Um, the happier that Kim is, the happier that I am. So instead of me seeking to be happy, I find myself seeking to make her happy. And the happier that she gets, the more happy I get. It's kind of a paradox. It's like in the scripture, it says, you know, whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will find it. So whoever gives up their life for Jesus Christ will find it. Well, in finding that, I find a joy. And then I give up my life for Kim, so to speak, on some things. And every once in a while, she'll say, hey, you want to go do this? Or you want to do that? I'm like, All right. inside, you might think, oh, I don't want to do that. But really, I go, sure, babe, that's a great, you know, let's go do that. Because I know it's going to make her happy. One time we went on vacation. I had an airplane and we flew to New England. And we landed in a grass strip and taxied right up to the bed and breakfast. And they gave us their car and said, oh, go check out our town. Well, we saw this ad for this place. And they had old advertisements and stuff like that. Like, you know, the buckboards like you'd see on the westerns from the 1800s? They actually had the printed ads that were on the paper that was printed in the 1800s. And they salvaged all kinds of stuff like that. And I says, you want to go? And she goes, yeah, okay, let's go. And we found out after we went that neither one of us wanted to go. But you know what? We bought some things for our house and it's still hanging up here today. And we loved the place. We thought it was great. But, but we both caught, thought, <laughs> went because we both thought the other person wanted to go. <laughs> Absolutely. And it was a good lesson for us. I get joy when Kim has joy. So one of the examples that we have is that Kim likes to sew things. She's really good at sewing. And so she'll come out with something. She's done a quilt or something and sewed something for the grandkids. And she'll want to show it to me. And I know, I know that she needs her ego stroked at that time because 
she didn't have the caveman syndrome like I have needing that. But I love to make her feel good and go, babe, that is so neat. I love those colors you put together. And maybe she'd even come and ask me about the difference in colors. Not that I would know anything, but I contributed, you know. Yes, and I'll say, did. that was the right choice. That was a good color. You know, so when I see her happy, I'm happier than if I ever tried to be happy on my own. And that's just a good feeling to, to try to make her happy. And uh, it all gives paybacks to each other. It's like rolling a snowball down the good side of the mountain or the bad side of the mountain. It's going to get bigger. If you, if you praise each other, you accept each other, and you do what the other person might want to do, the snowball on the good side gets bigger and bigger. But if you do the opposite on the other side of the mountain, the bad snowball is going to get bigger and bigger too. And one of the things I do as a marriage counselor is the snowball is rolling down the bad side of the mountain. we got to get in front of it, stop it, roll it to the top of the mountain, and get it going back down the other side. That's work compared to just maintaining and thinking and being positive around your spouse. That's not really much work. That's just paying attention and being attentive to their needs. It's a lot more fun to roll the snowball the good way. So a lot less effort. A lot less effort to roll it down the good mountain and try and roll the bad one up back up. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so let's bring this all together. In a, in this conclusion, we have four different points, and the first one is your expectations need to be realistic. Uh, marriage isn't about me; it's about us. And when you have an expectation, first of all, identify it, and then look and say, is my spouse in this expectation or not? Something to think about. What's next, Kim? Secondly, you aren't the creator. God That's is. Right. Um, make a makeover of your spouse is just a false hope notion that's more apt to guarantee your frustration than satisfaction. So yeah. accept the person that God made. Thirdly, you don't have it all together. You might think that you do, but you don't have it all together. And I don't have it all together. So this lowers my expectation. I know Kim has to come down to my level sometimes and love me when maybe I'm not the most perfect person. Therefore, I have to do that for her. And so we have a lot of give and take in those areas like that. And you, know, you might think, well, it's a 50-50 thing. You know what? Go out and give a lot more than 50%. And maybe you'll be given 50%. <laughs> you just, we just think that we're probably giving more than we are. We think we give all the giving and they do all the taking. Mm -hmm. It's probably not true at all. Probably not true. So try to give 80 or 90%. And if the other person feels they're giving 80 or 90%, you're probably about 50-50, okay? Probably. All right. <laughs> Fourthly, get your joy from Christ and your expectations of your spouse will diminish. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you let God come in and fill up your God tank, then you're going to be fulfilled and you won't put that pressure on your spouse because they weren't ever meant to fill that place to yeah. begin with. So we all have two tanks and we have a God tank and we have our love tank for our spouse and let God come in and fill that tank. You know, a lot of people, I think, aren't really letting God come in and fill that tank. Instead, they're just leaning more on their spouse. And I think a lot of people maybe aren't where they really would like to be. Sometimes people come to us and I'll say, where do you feel you're at with God? And they'll say, well, I'm not as close as I'd like to be. You know, I had a professor one time that says, that's not true. He said, we're, we're as close to God as we really want to be. If we wanted to be closer to God, we would be. And I think, ouch, that hurts, but it's realistic. It's realistic. So get draw close to God, and then your expectations of your spouse are just going to diminish. You're not going to need as much from them. And you know what? If your if your love tank is full and she wants to go to the mall, you can go to the mall. It's not it's not going to kill you to go to the mall. As a matter of fact, you can have fun. You can say, "Hey, go to the mall. That's great. Oh, I'll stop by and yeah, maybe you can go and get a pretzel, you know, while you're there, <laughs> and so or get ice cream or a cookie or something like that." Yeah. So. Yeah, look at it and try. at the end of the day, try to fulfill her needs. And it would be very rare that a person doesn't respond uh, if you really, really strive to fulfill their needs. When we're working to fill our spouse's love tank, if you stop and think about it, that's the very thing that God would have us to do. That's the very thing that he would have us to do. Thank you so much for watching today. We'd appreciate it if you like this. Uh, subscribe if you're on YouTube. And by all means, get us your input on this and say, hey, here's something you might not have thought of. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are, too. So have a wonderful day. Make sure you check us out at keepingthevows.com. And take care. God bless. Where we'd like to help you discover and maintain a Christ-like marriage. I need to do that over again. <laughs> say where we'd like to. Where we'd like to help you discover and maintain a Christ-like marriage.